Happy game day, everybody. Welcome to Game Quest. It is a VolQuest.com game day podcast. I am Eric Kane alongside Grant Ramey. And Game Quest is presented by our great friends over at Premier Garage of Knoxville, East Tennessee's number one provider of custom garage, flooring, cabinetry, storage solutions. Be the best Tennessee fan this football season by ordering the Smoky Gray Hobbit Polymer Floor today. That's at PremierGarageKnoxville.com slash Vols. PremierGarageKnoxville.com slash Vols. Grant Ramey, Tennessee Volunteers are 2-0 and here in the young season. Game number three is set for Neyland Stadium Saturday night, 7.45 Eastern time. It'll be televised on the SEC Network. And right here from the top, man, it's uh, it's going to get ugly in this one, wouldn't you say? Uh, let's just say Josh Heupel understood the assignment with the non-conference schedule because you got a Power 5 team that you could put 50 on and beat by 41. Uh, at a neutral site in their own state, and you've got an FCS school uh, to start the season that you could put 69 on, and now you have the worst team in Division One football in Kent State, if we can still call it Division One football. Uh, and in November, you have one of the other worst teams in Division One football, if we can still call it Division One football in UTEP. Uh, so it's a, it's I don't, I don't know. You get 12 of these as a fan, so enjoy it. Um, at the same time, I don't know. Maybe maybe you look at this as a stress-free kind of Saturday because you're not too worried. You're 49 and a half point favorite, whatever the line is now. Um, you're going to win this football game. It should be a repeat of Chattanooga, if not worse, from a couple of weeks ago. Um, and at least for our selfish benefit, it's either a noon kickoff, like it was 1245, whatever, for Chattanooga, or the end of the day, 8 o'clock, 745, whatever it is for Kent State, so we can actually watch some football in between. Yeah, what you said there is something I think we should remember. And I mean, certainly I'm not trying to tell people how to fan, but like the way I look at this, like our whole career is based around 12 regular season football games. Like as a football fan, I'm a football junkie. I love football. We only get 12 of these. So yeah, sure. Kent State, according to, uh, we'll get into this for sure. But according to the ESPN FBI, the worst FBS football program in the country. And it's been that way for a while. It's It started off in all the offseason rankings that way. Opening seas, opening week, going into week three. It's a really, really bad football team. But again, you only get 12 of these guaranteed. And so, you know, only get a couple of them at Neyland Stadium. So, um, man, just just kind of enjoy it. And that's certainly the the mindset I have going into it. But uh, we're going to get to Kent State. Go ahead. It's, it, it's a weird kind of setup to the schedule this season. I was talking about this with somebody Saturday in, in Charlotte. There's not a big home game until October 12th. It's just yeah. so strange like yeah the season opener is a big deal there's a lot made out because everybody's been counting down for eight months seven months however long to get back to that point so that's a big deal and football season's back and everybody's celebrating and all that stuff but it's 69 to 3 nico doesn't take a snap in the second half you know you play your entire roster you play everybody that's ever gotten near the anderson training complex at that point um and then come back after the neutral site game in charlotte and it's kent state and then you go two straight on the road in sec play with that bye week in between with uh, Oklahoma, bye week, Arkansas. It's not until Florida, October 12th. Is that correct? Yeah, because mm-hmm. Arkansas is October 5th. It's just, I don't know. It's a strange step. You're used to that maybe week three, week two, whatever it is. There's a huge home game, usually Florida or whoever else. It's just, uh, the, and then, you know, it feels like they're away from home the entire month of September. Uh, and then they're here, they're home for whatever it is, four straight games over a five week span. So it's just a different schedule, different feel to it this year. Yeah, certainly it is. Um, Take advantage of this one because you're on the road next week in Oklahoma, and that's that's the game everybody's kind of talking about right now. And, and we as fans, we as media, we can look ahead. If I'm if I'm those guys in that locker room, certainly the coaching staff isn't you know looking ahead or preaching to look ahead. Uh, you got to take it one game at a time. But you know we don't have to. We, we can look ahead because we know Tennessee's going to win this game uh, by by a pretty wide margin. Before we get into Kent State, before we get into kind of looking at this season from a two game glance already, and uh, kind of revisiting some season predictions. <clears throat> Grant, if you want to change yours. Um, I do what, happened? Look- what happened? What happened? What do I need to change for? What happened? <laughs> I do want to look back at the NC State win. Um, Grant, I think all of us thought that, um, you know, as the as we led up to that week and as, as we uh, kind of got closer to kickoff, I think everybody and their mother was picking Tennessee to win. But it started to get to that point to where it was like, okay, well, Tennessee's going to cover. Tennessee's going to win this by a couple of touchdowns. Tennessee's going to blow them out. Despite that kind of being the feeling, I still did not envision 51-10. to 10. I didn't envision a, a pick six, um, two pick sixes in this football game. I didn't envision the complete and total dominance of that defense and that defensive line. And, and Grant, we've talked about this all offseason, 
and, and it's going to be a point of conversation leading into every game this season. But to see it play out the way it did, it was a Rodney Garner defensive line that went 13 deep, 14 deep, and they just made it a living heck all game long for Grayson McCall, all game long for NC State's offensive line. And for them to run 17 plays, get 27 yards total in the second half, I mean, that, that that's that I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, dramatic here. But I mean, that, that's a historic performance there in the half. And I mean, that was quite a game defensively for Tennessee. I mean, I picked NC State to score 31 points. So if I if I don't already look stupid enough for maybe saying this team's going to lose three games, uh, maybe you can add that to the to the ledger. And, and yeah. maybe that's a that's a you know statement on preseason rankings and trying to figure out which teams are good because I don't think NC State's anywhere close to a ranked team uh, at this point in the season. I don't know if they will be. I thought Tennessee's defensive front was going to be really really good. I did not know they were capable of playing the way they played against NC State and making a team like NC State that I thought was supposed to have a pretty good offensive line look the way they did because you all off season it was James Pierce James Pierce James Pierce that was the name you heard. It's been everybody but James Pierce, and I, that's not a, that's not a dig at James Pierce. That's not a slight. He's going to get the most attention, and he's going to get his at some point. But the guys that have been doing it so far, Omar Norman Lott. I mean, he played like 14 snaps against NC State, and it felt like he was disruptive on every single snap. Omari Thomas, Joshua Josephs, like there are so many guys, so many names. Bryson Eason, like you feel Tyree West. It feels like you're just going to leave somebody out when you try to start naming them because there's so many of them. And they've all been so disruptive. And that push they got just consistently. I mean, NC State wasn't going anywhere running the football. Um, uh, Grayson McCall couldn't do anything dropping back. Like, Tennessee played with a short field, and NC State helped them out a lot with those fumbles and all that stuff. But Tennessee also forced that pressure, forced those fumbles. Those were strip sacks when that happened. There were some bad exchanges. Obviously, that's on NC State. But I think that's because you set that tone at the start of the game. Like, they're going to be in the backfield all night. And for them to do that, man, and, the, and how quickly it got out of hand, maybe it's different if uh, NC State goes in and scores there and makes it 10-10 in the second quarter. Uh, but the way it just rolled once Tennessee got going. And it didn't feel like Tennessee played all that great offensively. Like the run game super efficient. I'm still the president of the Dylan Sampson fan club. I think he's great. He's only going to get better, and he's still underrated. But I didn't know they were capable at this early point in the season to play in the way they did just a complete football game defensively against a opponent that might not be that great, but the way you played at that level is very, very impressive. Yeah, we're going to look at Dylan Sampson, kind of where he stacks up in the SEC through two weeks. And talking about James Pierce getting his, I mean, there are days where, Grant, you only post four or five articles, but we know the next day you're going to post like nine or ten. So it's going to even out. We're, we're, you're going to get double yours. Teams. Am I getting chipped? Am I getting what? What, what look am I getting? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you got a tight end that's staying in the block against you, but you're going to get yours eventually, right? That's that's what James Pierce is going to be about. Um, before we kind of transition here, uh, last thing on the NC State game, you mentioned offensively. I, I couldn't agree more, man. They ran the football so well. I mean, anytime you run for almost 250 yards, like you can't say the offense had a bad day. They they went with that 12 personnel, two tight end look for uh, for a lot of the time, and that's something that Tennessee can do moving forward if needed. Um, Nico made a lot of plays, made, made, a, made a couple of mistakes, had two turnovers, and that's going to happen. He's a young quarterback. There were only two wide receivers running routes on his first interception, and he they were dropping eight, and he threw it he threw it to where four red jerseys were. I mean, that's just a, that's a silly mistake and one he'll grow from. The second one, you know, he got clobbered while throwing it. Maybe you should have just went down and, and taken the sack there. But um, I thought Nico made a whole lot of plays. It's not his best play of the day was the touchdown to Miles Kitzman that got called back um, because of a, a phantom offensive lineman down the field, which which didn't happen. I guess point is, still, with all of that, it felt like Tennessee's offense was far from good, and that's a scary thing for everybody else in the Southeastern Conference because Tennessee's offense still did a whole lot in that game, and, and overall you won a football game by 41 points, and your offense probably had a C effort. What I was impressed with was Nico's response from that interception because he yeah. forced it in there. He was in front of Brew. And if, if defenses are going to drop eight against Tennessee, then then go ahead. Tennessee's going to run for 249 uh, if you're going to drop eight. Like that's that's if you're going to go that way, then go with it and Tennessee's going to run the football. But the way Nico responded, like the way Nico, I don't know Nico, but the way he comes across in the media, he's just so flatline, even kill, not too excited, not too low. I watched the replay of the game the other day. It looked like he had that same exact demeanor on the sideline after the interception, uh, after touchdown passes, after a touchdown run, whatever. 
I think it was my, maybe two attempts later after that pick was that deep ball to squirrel that he put right on the money, right in stride, right there on the sideline, uh, dropped it in the bucket like he did against Chattanooga. That was a huge response. Uh, just the, the easy throws to Miles Kitzelman when he sneaks out there, he rolls right once when nothing's really happening. Uh, the touchdown pass was another one that uh, he's wide open. It would be easy to get excited and overthrow him or, or miss him or whatever. It's just and, and the play you're talking about with the, the phantom downfield where uh, it's just scramble drill and Miles sees Nico and Nico sees Miles and, and Brew McCoy also got down the field on that as well yeah. and, and kind of executed there. Um, so his response and, you know, he looked human with that interception. It was ugly and he responded in a good way. Um, and I think he's going to be fine, too, if, if they run for 250 a game, if they can live that way. That's, I think he's going to be signing up for that all the time. But I was, I was really impressed with how he responded because of how elite he looked in week one. You knew it wasn't going to be that easy in week two. And for him to have, kind of have that early mistake where you say, oh, boy, what's going on here? And for him to respond the way he did as a redshirt freshman in his third career start, I thought that was huge. I think Tennessee's got a good one at quarterback. Just me. Just me. Maybe I'm going to go out on a limb there. Going to go out on a limb here and say Tennessee uh, has got a pretty good one at quarterback right now. Hey, when we come back, we're going to look at Kent State, tell you all about Kent State, what you need to know. And we're going to look at Tennessee through two games here of the season where some of Tennessee's players stack up amongst other players in the Southeastern Conference. Do you want to tell you about our friends, the presenting sponsor of the show? Uh, this is Knoxville Premier Garage. All right. Premier Garage in Knoxville. Garage guys or gals who bleed orange, do you use your garage for some sort of man cave? Watching football throughout the fall or maybe even trying to get a quick escape from the family? If you're like me, I like to start every football Saturday in my garage watching college game day or even the, the, the start of that new 1245 game on the SEC Network. It is your place, a place to kick back a few cold ones, maybe escape from it all watching football this season. So here's a question for you. What better compliment to this garage, a sanctuary of sorts, then Premier Garage of Knoxville's custom smoky gray hybrid polymer floor. Premier Garage of Knoxville, East Tennessee's leading provider of custom garage flooring cabinetry and storage solutions. And, and talking about that floor that I was talking about right here, look at it. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous floor right there, that big old power T, but uh, the smoky gray. I mean, Tennessee wears it on the field, so might as well flake your garage in it as well. They only use company employees as opposed to subcontractors to ensure that you receive consistent craftsmanship and personalized attention. 15 plus years of business locally owned and operated. Thousands, thousands of satisfied customers. Schedule a free in-home consultation by visiting Premier Garage of Knoxville.com. That is Premier Garage of Knoxville.com. And uh, you can you can set up your appointment today. The ball sport of those smoky grays last weekend and looked pretty darn good doing it. So why not flake your garage with the same Tennessee smoky gray hybrid polymer floor? Check it all out at Premier Garage of Knoxville.com slash falls. I had it pulled up here if you're watching on YouTube, a great landing page that you can check it all out. It's Premier Garage Knoxville.com slash falls. And of course, I want to tell you about our friends over at Price Picks, proud sponsor of the show. Uh, in this football season, you can have a whole lot of fun winning 100 times your money back by placing a, a small bet. It's the most fun I've ever had winning all this money back this football season. You just have to select two or more players, pick more than or less than the projected stats, and place your entry. Testing my skills on Price Picks this football season, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into into $1,000 with just a few taps. So all you have to do is you have a player grid, right? And you got six two, between two to six players. They have a projected stat total for the upcoming game. You pick more than that stat total or less than. So take Nico, for instance, take Dylan Sampson. We don't like the less thans. Life is too short. We like the more thans. So you can have anywhere between two and five and watch the winnings roll in. How do you get started? Well, you go to pricepicks.com slash VQ and put in the promo code VQ to receive a guaranteed $50 once you pay, once you play a $5 in lineup. Again, that is pricepicks.com slash VQ, promo code VQ to receive a guaranteed $50 once you play $5 in lineups. College football, NFL season, NASCAR, I mean, whatever the sport is, you can get the play over at pricepicks.com. Don't forget the promo code is VQ, pricepicks.com slash VQ. All right, guys, welcome back into GameQuest, the ballquest.com game day podcast. Tennessee and Kent State coming up later tonight, 745 Eastern time at Neyland Stadium. And 
Grant Ramey, why don't we take a look at Kent State here a little bit? First and foremost, you've done uh, a lot of these, you know, season previews and, you know, what, what Tennessee opponents did this week and all that. I've, of course, at the first glance and kind of dove into to Kent State this week. This is, simply put, man, I mean, it's it's a really bad football team. It's been a bad football team for a couple of years. Hasn't won an FBS football game since 2022. Um I mentioned the ESPN Power Index earlier. It's the last ranked team in FBS. Things can get ugly. Um, how ugly can it get? I mean, according at the time of this recording over at FanDuel, Tennessee spread is at, the spread is at forty nine and a half with the total at sixty two and a half. You hammer the over on this one if if I'm if I'm uh, gonna play, and of course I'm taking Tennessee in that humongous line there at forty nine and a half. I mean, the context, all the context you need is Chattanooga was, what, a 38-and-a-half point dog. I think that's what it opened at. I don't know what it closed at. And you're talking about this one open nine points above that and moved to 49-and-a-half. So it was even worse than uh, what the Chattanooga line was. I mean, I think that speaks to what the football program, the, the you know, how they compare what Vegas thinks of Chattanooga versus Kent State. And I'm not trying to disparage Kent State or whatever. I hope, I hope Kenny Burns uh, – uh, head coach Kenny Burns at Kent State is, is you know, preaching patience because they're going to have to have it. I mean, they won one game last year, and it was last September against Central Connecticut State. Uh, oh. That's an FCS school from the Northeast Conference, the same Northeast Conference that St. Francis, uh, parentheses, PA was from, that, that went at, uh, won at Kent State last week. You never want to lose to a team that's got a state in parentheses uh, next to the name. So that's, that's not great for Kent State. It's going to be a while. Um they go to Penn State next, which is insane to me. You go to number seven Tennessee one week. You go to number eight Penn State the next week. I hope they're getting paid good money from this stuff. But, no. man, to be ten points worse in the spread than an FCS school is, is wild to me. No rushing touchdowns through two games so far for Kent State's in this football program, and this football team. Uh, they're averaging 246 yards of total offense, 20 points per game. It's two games. And that's uh, uh, that's about a touchdown more points per game than they average all of last season. Uh, I guess I should mention they opened the season losing fifty five to twenty four at Pitt, and uh, of course, as you just mentioned, they lost at home to FCS St. Francis twenty three to seventeen. But yeah, they're averaging two hundred forty six yards of total offense. Um, they're averaging fifty four yards on the ground. He, here's a stat that I think is just wild to me. Um, third down conversion so far this year. In two games, they converted on five of 30 opportunities. That is 16%. Is that Ooh, bad? That is, that is not good. In the red zone, they've had five trips. They have scored twice. They have scored one touchdown in five trips to the red zone. Um, defensively, they're giving up 40 points a game, averaging almost 500 yards of total offense, averaging almost 200 yards on the ground. Um, not good on third downs. They've allowed... Seven, they've allowed points in seven of eight red zone trips and six touchdowns total. So, um, on paper, again, really, really bad football team. They got a running back that didn't play football last year, to my understanding. Um, he's their leading rusher, if you want to call it that. Their backup quarterback is now their starting quarterback from a season ago. Um, he's he's okay. They don't complete passes at a high clip. Um, again, they've allowed 19 TFLs in two games as an offensive line. It's, it's, you know, Tennessee can play its backups. It will play its backups at times, Grant, and, and the, the score should continue to grow as the game goes on. All those things you're mentioning, like, or, you know, what they're walking into is kind of worst-case scenario. You're giving up 200 on the ground. Well, here comes Tennessee, who runs for 250 against NC State. And in my opinion, it's got one of the best backs in college football in Dylan Sampson. you got a future first-round pick at quarterback. They're, if they're not running the ball, he's going to pick you apart. Through the air, uh, what the defense did against NC State, you would imagine they could do so even more against um, Kent State, what they did against Chattanooga. I mean, they haven't given up a touchdown. They haven't allowed a touchdown since November when Vanderbilt was in the stadium. Like, that's the kind of run they're on, and I think they're just getting better. Um, it's, it should be you know, a, a repeat of Chattanooga, honestly. And it's, it, I've listened to what you all said on the roundtable and podcasts and all this stuff this week. It is tough to kind of – balance these games because you want to get everybody reps but also you know nico needs to get enough reps too to kind of stay sharp and you don't want to completely bench those kind of guys and, and get them kind of out of the field but it's almost like an nfl preseason game and then the season opener and then another preseason game and then back into the regular season like how do you manage that as a coach like defensively i don't think it's a huge deal because there are already you know rotating like hockey shifts and nobody's playing a ton of snaps yeah. and 
oh, that's great for later in the year. Offensively, you know, you, you don't want to risk injury, but you also don't want to completely side on your guys and throw off everything that they've been kind of working towards and, and the, I guess the flow that they're in and all that stuff, the regular season kind of rhythm of it all. So I think that's the tricky part is trying to manage the snaps and manage the reps and, and try to do the best case scenario without putting your team at risk. Yeah, and, and like – like Nico needs more reps, you know, some of these guys need reps, reps hurt reps, and, and it's a great opportunity to get them. But in the same sense, it's like, I mean, every fan is like, I, I don't want Nico to get hurt, right? I mean, you had uh, the game uh, against um, a- whatever game that Cedric Tillman got hurt. Was it Akron? Um, Akron, yeah. Yeah, Cedric Tillman got hurt in a game that meant nothing, and he was pretty much out for the rest of the year. I know he came back and made some appearances and – and all that, but he was certainly not the same player. I mean, he was pretty much done for the rest of the year, and, and that is what you don't want in a game like this. I mean, there's no way to like stop that. Like, you got to go out and play hard. If you don't go out and play the football game hard, you are going to get hurt because somebody else is going to be playing harder than you. Um, football's a contact sport. Just look at the extra points. You know, with Tennessee. I mean, it's a lot of injuries there. Um, it, it's tough to uh, it, it, it's it's tough to stay injury free in this game, but you can't go out there and play scared. So if you're Josh Heupel, how would you manage this? I mean, you mentioned defense. I couldn't agree more. It's already a rotational thing. But if you're Josh Heupel, how are you managing Nico? How are you managing Sampson and, and that starting offensive line uh, in, in terms of trying to get reps, doing it the right way, and then also getting them out before they're hurt? Yeah, I mean, the Cedric Tillman scenario is, is worst case worst case scenario, and, and you try to guard against it, but it's impossible to guard against it. You could have injuries in practice. I mean, that is what it is. It's football. It's a physical game. I don't think Nico takes a snap without the starting offensive line in front of him because in my head is that rep against Chattanooga in the second quarter when I don't even know what the score was, but I think it was Larry Johnson yeah. at one of the tackles and, and Nico gets kind of rolled up on from behind. Like that's panic move, panic mode. You don't want to see that. Don't let the guy get touched. If he's in the game, your, your starters need to be in the game with him. And then I would just go kind of, it's kind of similar to what they did against Chattanooga. If you can get out to a huge lead, if it's, if it's nothing from the start for you to jump out to a 38 nothing lead, then coast in the second half, get your younger guys involved. Like, yeah, they need to get other guys involved that haven't have been as involved. I guess Dante Thornton had maybe one target against NC State. Chris Brazel, maybe he could do more. Mike Matthews, Braylon Staley, those guys, Deshaun Bishop, Peyton Lewis, all those young guys that are the depth pieces uh, that you're going to need some something from uh, on down the road. I mean, obviously, we, we saw it with Deshaun Bishop against NC State with Cam Selden now. Um, if you can take care of business early, then I'd get everybody out by halftime and, and kind of turn your attention to Oklahoma and, and go from there. We'll come back to Kent State. We'll get some score predictions. We'll get some bowl predictions. But uh, I do want to look at some of the SEC leaders here through two weeks. And, and again, you know, Tennessee played UTC, and then Tennessee played NC State. NC State was a top 25 matchup at the time. We'll see how they finish the year. A lot of teams have played cupcakes. Some teams have played, you know, bigger games than others. But here's two games. And look who's leading the SEC in rushing right now. That is Dylan Sampson, 256 yards, six yards more than than Jackson from Arkansas. Um, you look at, I believe, a uh, scoring Tennessee's Dylan Sampson tied for the league lead with five touchdowns already um, through two games, tied again with Jackson from Arkansas. Uh, you look at Nico; he's at fourth. And really, I thought about this the other day. Like, I mean, Nico's played of the possible eight quarters. Nico's played what five of them, <laughs> like. So he, he's fourth in the SEC in passing right now with 525 yards passing, uh, but he's only played five of the possible eight quarters so far. Look at this one down here, if I can find it. Uh, Squirrel White's fourth in punt return yardage. I think he's done a really, really good job in terms of being a returner. All-purpose, Dylan Sams is leading the all-purpose yards in the SEC, 322, five more than Coleman Jr. from Mississippi State. And got one more i want to show you here we go field goals look, look who's leading the sec in field goals right now look at you max gilbert and he, he was a, per, a perfect five for five before he missed that six attempt on that 53 yard of the other night yeah yeah five of six um and he spoke to the media the other day and like i mean like he looked like a kicker he didn't and i mean no disrespect to kickers he he seemed really confident in himself he seemed really confident in his abilities almost like I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but he was like almost borderline cocky a little bit. And I got, you don't see that from kickers a lot. Maybe that's just me looking into it, but I'm like, huh? Okay. I like that. Um, but he, his play on the field certainly backs that up right now through two yeah. games. And that, yeah. that's a good thing, Grant, because we had no idea about Tennessee's place kicker and he's come on. He's, 
He, he's had a really good opening to the season, and and there will be pressure kicks in Norman next week, and I think he's well-equipped to try to go out there and handle that situation. Give me the arrogant kicker over the head case kicker any day of the week. And when his number's been called, he's been fine. He's been straight down the middle. It's been far enough. I mean, 53, maybe that's a little bit of a stretch. Like he missed the other night against NC State. I don't really blame him there. Uh, the biggest stat from that page you were just looking at is total yards with Dylan Sampson because I think he's so good out of the backfield, whether it's that shovel pass or just check downs or whatever. Man, when he gets the ball in his hands in space, he's so hard to get on the ground. He's so talented. I want to pay Manny to say we got an idiot kicker. No, he said punter. He said punter, right? We got an idiot punter. Oh. At least he's uh, he's not Brian Callahan saying if we punted on first and ten every time, we'd be fine. <laughs> All right. Tennessee and Kent State. Um, let's give a couple. Let, let's have some fun with this, right? I mean, they literally should empty the bench. Um, every football player that's in uniform that's available should play in this football game. This is one of those games to where, like you saw against NC State, some of those guys that played against UTC did not play against UT State, uh, uh, NC State because they might be a red shirt candidate, right? So you're trying to save one of those games. Um, this is one of those games where if you red shirt, you'll play in, like for sure. So um, I, I think that there's going to be a whole lot of different players. I think that there's going to be a whole lot of snaps and everything. And so uh, give me a couple of different bold predictions, bold takes, something you want to see maybe. Uh, Braylon Staley touchdown and a Mike Matthews touchdown in the same game. Um, and I'll go to Sean Bishop, 137 yards and two touchdowns. Now, don't want to pat myself on the back, but here, here goes me straining my rotator cuff. Um I think last week I was 163 and three touchdowns for Dylan Sampson. Total yards, mind you, and he finished with 169 and two touchdowns. So he showed that you. Close, that might be as close as I get all season. So we'll go there. Take a bow. Take a bow, man. That's that. That, that was. That do was I need to do on. a score prediction as well? Yeah, do a score prediction. Uh, 69 again. Nice. It's like Chattanooga. 69 to five. Kent State is a safety better than Chattanooga on Saturday. How are they going to get a safety? No Show your work. I'm curious. Uh, How are they going to get a safety? Uh, Tennessee punts in the fourth quarter when there's 37 people in the stands and it's 11:37 Eastern time, and uh, it goes over the head of whoever the third punter on roster is uh, and out of the back of the end zone. Is that a safety? I think that's a safety. That is a safety. Is there going to be more people in the press box uh, than the stands by the by the game's end? There might be. There'll, there'll be more people at Neyland in the fourth quarter than North Carolina State fans at Bank of America uh, by the start of the fourth quarter Saturday night. It won't be that bad. Some, I'll get them out of here in a moment. Somebody asked in the mailbag earlier this week, um, you know, could Tennessee break the Neyland Stadium scoring record in this game? Um, and, and so we, we went and looked it up, and according to the, I guess, the modern era. Uh, Can know, I they, guess? Go ahead. Can I guess? Yeah. Uh, 70 against UL Monroe in yeah, 2000? Yeah, that was it. Okay, nice. Yep. 70 against U- UL Monroe, that was 2000, right? It was. I, all I remember was a homecoming game, I think, and it was raining, something like that. I don't know. I got sketchy memories. I just remember they scored 70 points. So I, I guess that's the modern era because the record book for that specific set only went back to 1937. Tennessee as a program has scored more, as you were so kind to point out on Twitter. They scored like 101 against Carson Newman back in <laughs> – like 1911. Um, Who, me? doesn't <laughs> sound like me. Yeah, yeah, you. Uh, Tennessee also scored like 115 against like uh, University of Cumberland's. But those games, to my knowledge, weren't played at Neyland. So um, if you're talking about strictly, uh, you know, Shields walked in the field, Neyland Stadium, yeah, I think Tennessee's going to break that record. I think they're going to score more than 70. And, and it's kind of one of those things, too. It's like, well, I mean, if you leave the starters in, of course you would, but you're not going to. But, like, can Gasson Moore, can Jake Merklinger, can Peyton Lewis, can Braylon Staley, Mike Matthews, can you can you continue on that path? And I think they will. I think Tennessee's going to score well. And here's another one for you. Tennessee will continue the streak. It will be four straight games dating back to last year that a touchdown is not allowed. Don't tell Tim Banks. Actually, Tim Banks doesn't know, so it doesn't matter. You know. <laughs> I don't keep up with that stuff. I 100% think that – well, not 100%. I, I'm I'm confident that will happen. Um, I mean, anything can happen, busted plays and all that. I mean, Tennessee will have some 
some red shirt freshmen in there and like things that can happen. But I, I like Tennessee's chances to continue down that path. Um, that's not really a, huh, that can be one of my bold takes. Uh, Tennessee doesn't allow a touchdown. Uh, give me a squirrel white punt return for a touchdown because he's, he's had a, he'll get a couple to begin the se- to begin the game and um, they're going to punt a ton and he's been, he, he's had some good returns. So give me a squirrel white touchdown punt return. Give me a – so you said Braylon Staley. AP's been on Mike Matthews for a couple weeks about this game, and in my mind I'm like, well, I want to say Braylon Staley because um, he flashed a lot in, fall, in in spring practice there before he got hurt. I'll go – I will also go Braylon Staley, Staley a touchdown, so you and I are both on that one. Um, I will go Peyton Lewis, and I hope Deshaun goes off in this game. I'll be intrigued to see how much, if any. Um, if he clears protocol, I think he'll play, but Cam Seldon um, – I think Peyton Lewis needs to get going in this game. So I'll go Peyton Lewis, 12 carries for 85 yards. It's a really solid day and something to build on it for Peyton Lewis. So We need a we need a score, though, right? I don't think you gave an actual score. Score, 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 score. I will go uh, something to three, maybe something to six. I'll go six. Um, let's go, go 70, 73. Go 73. That's a good number. 73 to 6. Tennessee breaks the to our knowledge the the scoring record at Neyland Stadium and Tennessee wins by almost 70 points against Kent State which is the worst football team in in FBS. Uh kind of out the door man, um anything you want to see in this game that would help your confidence or make you feel better about what's to come next week in Norman? Uh, if they repeat the Chattanooga game, I think that would be pretty big, uh, that they can handle their business, that they can not kind of get caught looking ahead or looking back at NC State and trying to figure out what you're going to do at Oklahoma. Like, yeah, you're right. We can all talk about it all week, and we can talk about Oklahoma game for two weeks and ignore this Kent State game. Uh, but we've seen a Austin P, whatever the final score of that game was. We've seen them be sluggish in other games. Just come out and handle business. I mean, it doesn't have to be 69-3, but if it's not competitive from the start and if you prove yourself from the start – play clean, play efficient, uh, you know, avoid uh, personal fouls, blocking people into the into the bench, block, uh, you know, late hits, all that stuff. Like, clean up that stuff, take care of the football, score points, uh, be the same defense you've been. I think if you do that, it just kind of continues down the same path where you've been extremely impressive for two weeks, and that would be another way to do that. Uh, to continue to be impressive would just be to handle business and, and do what you should do. In this yeah, I think for me, there's nothing that Tennessee can show me that's like, ah, now that I saw that, I think they're going to beat or I think they're going to cover or whatever in Norman next week. Um, just because, again, I'll do respect that's the opponent. Now, there are things that would give me pause. You know, everybody has a bad football game from time to time. But if you're sluggish, if you turn the football over, if you can't block a certain defensive end for Kent State and it's given Nico pressure or whatever, like I'm like, oh, ooh, okay. You know, I don't, I don't like that I saw that, man. I mean, if they did that with Kent State, imagine what Oklahoma can do. There are several things that might give me pause. Not saying I expect it, but I don't think anything Tennessee does. Because, I mean, whatever Tennessee does in terms of running up the score stat-wise, I mean, it, it should be expected against a team like this. So, I can't wait for next week, but also I can't wait to see a lot of these young guys play. in this one, Tennessee against Kent State, 745 on the SEC Network from Neyland Stadium. Uh, Grant Ramey, I am Eric Kane. Thanks so much for joining us here on Game Quest each and every game day right here at VolQuest.com. Big shout-out to our proud sponsors. That is Premier Garage of Knoxville. East Tennessee's number one provider of custom garage flooring, cabinetry, and storage solutions. Be the best Tennessee fan this football season by ordering the Smoky Gray Hybrid Polymer Floor today. That's at PremierGarageKnoxville.com slash falls. Go to PremierGarageKnoxville.com slash falls, and you can order your new Smoky Gray Hybrid Polymer Floor today. That is PremierGarageKnoxville.com slash falls. We'll be on the general quarters all day long. We'll have tons of content over at VolQuest.com. It is Tennessee and Kent State right here at VolQuest.com.